Welcome back. We are on the home stretch, is what we call it, in finishing up the letter called 1 Timothy. We're in the sixth chapter. We have just concluded a, a fairly long section where Paul has given instructions to Timothy on four different groups of people. First, a general group of people defined by age and gender, then to the widows, then instructions about the elders of the church, and last time when we were together, his instructions for the slave and how he was to treat his slave owner, whether or not that man was a believer. The gospel of Jesus Christ motivates everything. Well, as Paul turns his attention now in the next section of this letter, in chapter 6, verses 3 through 10, he returns to the theme of which he began the letter, and that would be the false teachers. These traveling teachers would come into the city of Ephesus, and many other cities too, and they would set up some place where they would give their speech or their doctrine or their teaching. And it would, some of them would sound very much like the gospel of Jesus Christ, only it would differ a little bit. Some would sound very much different than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And all of these different teachers who came in with all of their different approaches had an effect on the church in a very negative way. People got confused. They weren't sure what to believe. What teacher should we follow? Jesus had said this. Paul had said this. Timothy, what are we supposed to do? So Paul is trying to give advice to Timothy on how to handle these false teachers and the teaching that they have. And in this section, he's going to talk about the effect that these particular false teachings have on the church. It comes back to a little phrase that I introduced to you a few sessions ago, in which I said, belief drives behavior. You're going to hear it from me over and over again, all the way through the letter called 2 Timothy, because it, it's the bottom line truth of what he's trying to say. Belief, what we believe, determines how we behave, how we live, how we conduct our lives, not the other way around. So let's go down that path for a little while. If you want to find out what somebody believes, you observe how they behave. Because you can't just meet somebody and instantly look into their brain and say, oh, now I know what they believe. If you watch people, you can learn a lot about them. For, for example, back in America, I don't like to shop. I, my daughter likes to shop. My wife likes to shop. If we ever go to a mall where there's lots of stores, I get tired within a few minutes. I don't like to shop. But what I like to do is watch people. So I'll find they'll have a little place to sit down, maybe different places in the mall, and I'll just sit there and I'll watch people. And if you watch, teenagers walk by. They've got the iPod and the earbuds in their ears, and the way they dress and the way that they're talking to each other, I can learn a lot about what they believe. So maybe a mother walks by in her little baby carriage and maybe one or two small children and one child pulling on her mother's uh, clothes to try to get her attention. And the way she treats her child, maybe positively or negatively, it tells me a lot about what she believes. Or I watch a father and his children. Or it doesn't matter what kind of person. It doesn't matter whether they're rich or poor, young or old, man or woman. By watching how they treat each other, it gives me some clues into what they actually believe. So when Paul be continues with his idea here, he says, this is the observable behavior of people who sow the seeds of discontentment with the false teaching and its effect on the church. And what this section is going to help us do is help us see ourselves and how our needs are met and how we treat others and what our behaviors say about what we believe. So take your Bibles with me and turn back to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And I'd like to read verses 3 through 10. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 10. Now, in my Bible, they brought the last phrase of verse 2 along with verse 3 because they feel that that idea goes with it. So maybe your Bible has it a little bit different, but I have one short phrase before verse 3, and then I'll continue on. Here's what Paul says. Teach and urge these things. Those are the last words of verse 2. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, 
slander, evil suspicions, constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of great gain. Now there is great gain in godliness with contentment, for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will, be, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many pangs. So if I could break it down into two sections, I would look at verses 3 through 5, first of all. And I would say it this way. What you choose to believe has an effect on your relationships. What you choose to believe has effect on your relationships with other people. What they were doing here in this church, he says, if anyone teaches a different doctrine, does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and teaching that accords with godliness. I want to just stop there for a minute. When he talks about the sound words, the meaning behind the word sound means it's healthy. If I go to the doctor for a physical examination, he, he tests me and he, tests my, he listens to my heart or he listens to my lungs or he checks me out and my, my flexibility and he says, Bruce, you are healthy, you are sound. That there, there is nothing wrong with you. He said that the, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ are sound. They are healthy. You can take them. You can dissect them. You can live them. You can implement them in your life. And he says, and the teaching that accords with godliness. So maybe that's a question that will help us answer particular teachings and things that we hear. Is what I'm hearing steering me toward godliness or away from godliness. He said, if the message that you are hearing steers you toward a godliness or a God-centered, gospel-saturated, Christ-oriented life, he said, that's the kind of teaching that you would listen to. But if the teaching that you're hearing to takes you away from the cross, takes you away from Jesus Christ, takes you away from a relationship with God and other Christians. He said, that's not the kind of teaching you should listen to. Let's talk about music for a minute. Uh, when I grew up, so when I was a little boy, it was the beginning of Christian contemporary music in America. There were not very many artists and there were not very many recordings made. So there wasn't a lot to choose from. A generation later, now when my children are choosing music, there is a huge amount of music under the heading of Christian music to choose from. Numerous categories. So my children and I have the same debate that my parents and I used to have about music. I would, my parents would say to me, it's too loud, I can't understand the words. And as much as I did not want to repeat my parents, sometimes I feel the same way about my children's music. But rather than reacting about the volume, or the particular style of music, I asked my children, what does the song say? About two months ago, I was challenging our son Landon. I said, Landon had me listen to on iTunes this particular song on the computer. And I said, I I'm sorry, Landon, I just can't understand it. Maybe it's my hearing. And so now, because of the internet, he went online and he found the words or the lyrics to that song. And he said, Dad, why don't you read this? And I read through the lyrics of that song, and I said, wow, these guys really understand the truth. The words that they're saying, and I was having, once I saw the words, and then I listened to the song again, then I could hear the words in the song, and I said, Landon, this group really understands the gospel. They really understand the, the word of God. And I go, good. It's not my favorite style of music. But I understand that the message that these guys are saying is in accordance with the sound teachings of Jesus Christ and a teaching that accords with godliness. And I said, that's okay, expressed in the unique style. And I just think that this message of godliness, it, it becomes like a beautiful tapestry. Do you know what a tapestry is? 
if you've ever bought a, a Persian rug or you've been to a museum where you look at this enormous piece of tapestry hanging there in the museum, and you look very closely at the threads and the colors used to make the particular pattern, you, you, you grow in your amazement and say, how this connected with this, and together it made this picture, which is part of the larger picture. I go, wow. That's what the message of Jesus Christ and the teaching of sound doctrine that accords with godliness is like. He continues on in verse 4 when he says, the person who teaches a different doctrine doesn't have that beautiful tapestry, doesn't have the gospel behind it. In fact, this is what this person becomes. He is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. Oh, I don't need to follow the teachings of Jesus. I don't need to follow the teachings of Paul. You know, they're so narrow and they're so restrictive. I, I want a more broad understanding of the universe. Whatever his particular description of that, he says, what that ends up doing is it makes it very me-centered. This, this is an incredible problem that we're having in America. I don't know if you're having the same problem in, in your country or not. But we are creating in America a very me-centered gospel. Well, you know, there are portions of the Bible that are difficult to understand, or there are portions of the Bible that I don't believe are God's Word, so I'm going to believe this part, but not this part. Or this part is too harsh, or, or this part, it doesn't fit with our culture anymore. You know, the Bible needs to grow and change along with our culture. When you do that, you become the center of your own gospel. You become the center of your own truth. And he says, when we do that, we get puffed up, we get conceited, we get arrogant, and honestly, we show that we don't understand anything. That this is God's Word. All of it, all 66 books, all of the authors that wrote were inspired by God Himself to give us what we have today. In fact, he continues in verse 4. This person who is conceited and puffed up has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words. They start to say, you know, if I can question this, but that person believes that, we're going to get in an argument or debate. Well, how can you hold on to that? And he says, well, how can you hold on to that? Or how can you believe this? Or how can you believe that? And so it begins to have this discussion and this debate, and that doesn't help the cause of Christ. All that does is it descends into a variety of arguments and dissensions, and it ends up dividing the church. In fact, the five words that he gives next are like a progression. If you have a basement in your home, or if you have a, a root cellar where you store some things, where you go down one step, and then down another step, and another step, and another step, these five words are like a progression down and down and down. Look at them. They quarrel about words which produce envy. Envy is wanting something. Is I don't have something that you have, and I want it. In the church, it might look like this. Well, he is a very good teacher. If only I could teach like him, then I would have some value. I would have some importance. That's envy. That disin disintegrates into the next one, dissension. Well, you know, if I had the time to prepare to study like he did, you know, Pastor Bruce, he, he has all these hours to lock himself in his study, but I don't have that. And you, do you know how much time he spends in study? He should be out with the people dissension and begins to divide. To the third word, slander. You start talking about that person to another. Did you hear how many hours Pastor Bruce spends in his study? Oh my goodness. Doesn't he understand that a pastor should be shepherding the sheep? You know, if he would, if he would spend less time in his study, God would speak to him more clearly if he would spend more time with us. Division begins to happen evil suspicion. When people start talking about another person, and at first they say, you know, I don't, I don't believe that that's true, but it's said enough time, they start to wonder, hmm, maybe Pastor Bruce isn't a good pastor. You know, I used to think that his messages were very good. They were spoke right to my heart, but after listening to these friends talk about him, and how he spends so much time in his study, I'm not sure that I think he's a very good pastor. 
What do you think? And the discord grows. Results in verse 5, constant friction among the people. And it wasn't that they were just arguing about the past or about Timothy. They were arguing about theological points. They would say, I believe this. Well, I believe this. Or they would argue about little details or about minutia or specific things. And he says that they ended up resulting in constant friction. Friction is when you rub back and forth and it gets raw and it gets painful and it does damage to the church and it does damage to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It becomes like a little bomb blowing up over here, a little bomb blowing up over here, and pretty soon the church is damaged and it becomes ineffectual. In our district of churches in the state in which I serve, we have a mediation team. And so what we do as a mediation team is we go into churches that are struggling and they will call the district office and they'll say, we'd like you to come and help us because we're having issues with, and it could be a variety of things, I'll just say, we're having issues with our pastor. So I and a a team of two other people, and I'm not on the team anymore, but I used to be, there were three of us that would go in and we begin to ask questions. We would interview people. And you know what we found? That they would bring us in because of one issue, but the more questions we asked, we would find two issues, three issues, four issues, five issues. Everybody knows what an onion is, right? An onion has layers. If you peel one layer of an onion off, there's another layer of onion, and then another layer of onion, and another layer of onion. That's what these problems in this church was. That the more layers of the onion we peeled away, the more problems we found. And by the time we got done, I remember thinking and talking with my partner. He said, I think that there's not one problem. They have 15 problems in this church. But it happened because of this conversation here unhappiness here, disharmony there, and all of a sudden they had a church that was severely divided. That's not what the gospel of Jesus Christ is supposed to produce in us. Verse 5, constant friction among the people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. Now that's a great phrase to remember. Godliness is a means of gain. Hey, If we follow God, he is going to make us successful. If we do this principle and that principle and that principle, God is going to bless us. This is another problem that we have in the West, in the American church. Some of it's labeled as the health and wealth gospel or the prosperity gospel. Hey, if you'll just give this amount of money, God is going to bless us. Or if you give me this or if you pray this, or if you, if you do this, then God is going to bless us. Our church is going to grow. We're going to have a global influence. We're going to go here. We're going to do this. And what we end up doing is we lose our focus on the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to have laser focus on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we end up saying, well, if I would do this, and if I would do this, then God is going to bless me. And what we're struggling with in America is a me-centered gospel rather than a Christ-centered gospel. So what we've been saying is belief drives behavior. And when the belief gets out of uh, accuracy or out of focus, it ends up damaging our relationships. And this was definitely damaging the church. Have you benefited from this teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? please consider supporting TBS with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. What was happening in that first century culture is that as these teachers would go about spreading their particular doctrine or their teaching, they would say, you know, in that town, I made this amount of money. If I could go into that town, I could make this amount of money. And that's another reason why they would say their godliness is a means of gain, but in it ending up being it not being a, a means of true godliness, it was actually a means of selfishness as a means of them saying that they could get ahead. One author wrote it this way. He said, where godliness is seen as a means of financial gain, it will never lead to the truth. Where godliness is seen as a means of financial gain, it will never lead to the truth. When I left farming to become a pastor, 
I didn't do it for the money. I wasn't a wealthy farmer. Our farming operation was a quality operation. We had good equipment. It might have been a means of financial prosperity in time. I did not leave farming for the money. There have been so many times in the years that we have been a pastor where we go, I don't, I don't know how we're going to survive. We have four children, and the adoption of Sasha was very expensive. But what we have seen is this. God provides in very unique and special ways. But don't ever let yourself think that if you get into ministry, it's going to make you rich. What we have found is that God has blessed us in many different ways. Some have been a financial gift. Some have been a word of thanks. Honestly, the best reward that I can ever get is a changed life. When someone comes to me and says, Pastor Bruce, because of something you said or preached, or the influence of some other person on my life, my life is transformed and changed. Paul says, I want you to think about that. Do not do ministry for the sake of financial gain. I want you to think of, for just a minute, three or four or five people that you are close to, that they would be your friends? Can you think of three or four people that you would say, these are my friends? What do you know about them? Who are they? Where do they live? What are they like? Then I'd like you to ask yourself this question. What does my relationship with them say about what I believe? What does my relationship with the three or five three or four or five people that I'm closest to say about what I believe. For some of you, when you look at those relationships, you say, boy, my relationship with those people, it makes me a better person. My relationship with Christ grows. But there are some of you who are watching or listening to this, you say, you know, it, because you've asked me to think about those particular people, my relationship with them is not healthy. It does not draw me closer to Jesus Christ. It's always about the gospel. Belief drives behavior. If you want to find out what you really believe, you look at your behavior. So what is your relationship with these three, four, five people like? Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.